welcome to this video on how the Honda Horizontal Semi-Automatic Clutch Pack works. Now keep in mind there are many types of semi-automatic engines, but this one specifically refers to the one with the clutch on the crank shaft, seen here. The twin clutch engine seen here is a completely different setup, so this video obviously does not apply to that. Okay, so what you can see in front of you is a crank shaft and it is attached, um, on the left is a clutch basket attached and on the right is the magneto and uh, the reason I have the magneto on there is just to act as a counterweight so it doesn't tip over, that's all. And um, I'm going to move the camera and now what you can see in front of you is a clutch basket um, without the bell attached to it and um, so just want to give you an idea of what it is you are looking at um, so that you can have a better idea. So to understand what the clutch does and how it works we have to understand what its job is and uh, believe it or not the clutch pack on the Honda C90 of the Super Cubs or these engines actually has four main purposes not just one not just to disengage and re-engage when you want to change gear it actually has four different things that it does and that's why if you take a look at it closely you see all these little you know, you've got nubs here and you've got a post here and you've got um, little poles in here and you've got discs and ramps and you know gears here and splines everywhere and collars and all that fun stuff and you might think well that just seems a bit overly complicated but it is actually quite necessary to do all of its jobs and that's that's what we are going to explain now so the four tasks that the clutch performs on this um, particular engine are the following first what it has to do, obviously, is disengage when you are at idle and then re-engage when you want to set off. So when you apply power and the engine spins up, it has to re-engage. Secondly, what it has to do is disengage at the click of a switch. Now, obviously, you can't shift gears only at idle. You know, your engine is going to be at varying RPMs. So you have to be able to disengage the clutch completely so that you can change gears whenever you please. The third function this clutch serves is that it is a slipper clutch as well. And I'll explain what a slipper clutch is when the time comes. And the fourth thing that this clutch is, believe it or not, is an oil filter. Yes, an actual oil filter not some sort of screen or some sort of strainer. This is an actual highly efficient oil filter that is reusable and rebuildable. And I will explain that when the time comes too. Actually, before we get into what the functions are, I'm going to show you the basics of the clutch. Okay, so taking a look at this engine over here, um, you can see this gear is the same one as this one. Okay, so same gear is on here. And you can see this is where the crankshaft is. You can see, you, you can somewhat see the bearing there. And the crankshaft, um, excuse me, the gear is what turns this drive gear here. This is, you can see it's a quite a drastic reduction. And so, but um, this gear is what drives the uh, main gear here. And this gear is what um, is connected to the transmission, which is ultimately connected to the gears um, that go to the, your wheel. And so, you might know that in a manual transmission vehicle that when you push in the clutch it disengages the engine from the transmission and which ultimately disengages it from the wheels and so in this engine where the decoupling so to speak uh, where the decoupling takes place is right here you can see this gear actually is not rotating the crankshaft and so if we take a look at the crankshaft here, you can see this gear is not um, attached at all. It, it is just completely freewheeling. And so this is where the decoupling takes place. You have the collar here. There, there's a spacer right here. Then you have the collar like this. And then the gear slides on top. So what we need is we need a mechanism to connect the crankshaft to this gear in order to drive that big gear that you saw on the engine earlier. So what that mechanism is, is right here. This It is the clutch. Now, I'm going to go through each of these parts slowly so that we can understand how this all works. So you can see this is the drive spindle and it is splined. 
Now, if we put that on the crankshaft, it doesn't move. It is complete because it's attached to the splines. And we have this assembly, which bolts, uh, that which bolts, which is attached to the back of the spindle. And um, you can see that there are teeth in here, like this. So, if we were to slide this assembly over, and and by the way, these those grooves are where this gear connects to. So now you can see where we are starting to um, fight to to make a coupling to the gear. See, this is a freewheeling gear, but um, when you stick it into this collar like this, it locks into place. And um, but you can see this spindle. It is still not connected to the spindle, but it is connected to this right here, and that you'll you'll see why that is um, important very soon. So now what we are going to do is take our clutch plates and have these attached. You can see that um, just like in a traditional clutch, the way that they go together is you have a metal plate. Um, so this is very similar or the same as how a manual clutch works is you have metal plate on top of a friction disc surface. So you see you have two friction disc surfaces here and then a metal surface. And then they alternate back and forth so you have metal, friction, uh, metal, friction, friction, metal, and then friction, and then on this side you have another metal side. So that you have effectively, you have five different surfaces that grip each other, and um, which is what you want. Now, you can see that if we, that so for example, now let's take the spindle and let us pick up the drive gear assembly put it on there you see it's still freewheeling like this but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting on the clutch disc so you see this disc does not attach to the spindle at all right but this disc has teeth in it and it also has friction disc material and that material is going to go down on top of here and um, this is the basic principle of how we are going to join this gear to this spindle remember the spindle is connected to the crankshaft and this gear is not connected to anything it is freewheeling now watch if I push if I push down on this disc just with my fingers right you see the disc is connected to here the spindle um, and the gear and the spindle itself connected to the crankshaft but now if I push down with my fingers you can see that it's starting to grip itself right it's starting to grip and because it's starting to grip, now what we are doing is we are creating a coupling between the spindle, which is this guy, remember, and the gear. And so now let's start sandwiching the clutch plates together. I'm going to put these on. So you see, oh, this, this one has tabs and this one is, and you can actually see that these rotate independently of each other. So I will... So what's the, the pole? I'm putting my thumb in the way so the pole does not um, spin. And you can see that these two discs inside are spinning independently um, of the, the plates on the outside that, that have the tabs on the outside. But if, um, and you can't feel this, but as I'm tr trying to turn this, it's actually, there's quite a bit of drag already. Um, you can see it doesn't, doesn't spin that freely already and I'm not even putting any pressure down. And then lastly, I'm going to take this metal side and install it over. So again, but still look, you can see that the spindle and the, the inside part is spinning independently of the outside of this spindle right here. And But you can see that we have, but if I push this together, now all of a sudden I can't spin, actually I, lit I can't spin it at all. I can't spin this. Um, you can see now that we have created, we have joined the two pieces together by just applying some pressure. And I, I literally can't spin that. I, I thought I could. Okay, so um, you get the point now. So now putting the clutch pack on the crank shaft, you can see how this works. So we have the independent gear. Now imagine that I can't rotate the crank shaft because it's what's being held up here. But imagine the crankshaft itself is rotating and um, this gear is spinning independently um, or it's not spinning at all it's the crankshaft that's moving but now if we want to engage the pack we keep it um, we hold it we apply pressure 
and that is what creates all that grippy force and that is why um, the clutch pack will then grip. Okay, so now that just explains the engage disengage, but I had to show you that to show you the individual pieces to show you the, the principle of why, um, of how we disengage and engage the clutch because it's nothing like a car where you have a single disc or maybe two discs and a flywheel. It has all these pieces in here and I'll explain what those pieces are in a moment, but I just had to give you that sort of visual lesson on what the parts actually are. So now what we're going to do is we are going to explore how the clutch pack disengages and re-engages simply by centrifugal force. Now you might have heard of centrifugal clutches before, you might have even worked with them. And um, if you have ever worked on automatic scooters, you probably know what a variator is, which is just something that has centrifugal weights on it. And those weights fling outwards the faster the engine spins. And the faster it spins, the more force those weights apply um, to the variator, which pushes against the drive belt and changes the gear ratios. That's how the automatics work. And so the variator is in fact a centrifugal type of, I guess you could say clutch, but not really, but it's a centrifugal mechanism. But when you think of centrifugal clutches that engage and disengage at idle, you might be thinking about something like this which is held together by a spring and then these shoes are what grip the outside of the, the housing. So when this spins faster, what happens is as these shoes spread outward, they grab the housing and then, um, they, then that's what is your grabbing force, if you will. But if you look at the, this thing, there's no such thing. There's no springs at all. And yes, there are springs that go on here, but those are not the same springs at all. These are the springs that go here are dampening springs, and the ones that go here are your main clutch springs. I'll explain those too. But um, you see, there's no such mechanism at all um, that that flings outward, or it, it would appear so. And um, so, how I'm going to explain this? Um, I apologize if this sounds a bit winded, but this is actually it's all necessary to understand how this whole thing works. So, remember how I said, if we were to kind of grip the plate together, grip the clutch sandwich together, it would stop spinning. So it's it's disengaged here, and then I apply force. See, it's disengaged. Oops, it's disengaged, but I apply clamping force, and now it is engaged, right? But if you look at the clutch pack in the back, like so you can see there's a bunch of screws that are holding it down, right? And that is, and they're inside of here, inside it has four of these springs like this, and that pushes the bell outwards like this. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, so those springs are providing the clamping force going that way. And um, you would be right, that is true, because these are the springs that you have to upgrade when you want more clamping force when you modify your engine. But what does that mean? when it comes to but how if if the clutch pack is constantly being pushed this way right it's going this way and it's pulling against the plates then how is it that you are going to disengage at idle because if the clutch pack is bolted together it doesn't matter you know if you if you've got constant force here it doesn't matter um how fast or slow you're spinning it's still going to be locked right so you you have a problem and you would be right, except for, I'm going to show you a little tiny thing that you probably did not see whatsoever, but it's right there. And I don't mean those four little things, although that's important. What you will notice is that there is actually a gap of about a millimeter right here. You can see the gap in between, right? You can see that gap. Now, if that gap did not exist, then what effectively would be happening is that this clutch would be sandwiched together by the springs and um, then it would be always engaged. But the thing is, is that the gap right there exists so that the clutch pack doesn't matter how hard, um, how, how hard the springs are pushing against everything, it's still disengaged. So because this pack is constantly disengaged, that means that we need to have some sort of mechanism that will push against this while the engine spins up. So when it's slow, 
the engine is spinning slow, it won't push against the the sandwich, um, I call it, and the plates, and then causing it to grip. Um, but when it's at idle, it will not push against the plates, and it will continually let this spin. And um, it's staring you right in the face, and uh, you probably... You might know this already, but not quite understand why. That is what these are here for. These are called the Bob weights. Hello, Bob. And these weights are, and, and if this is from a 50cc, which has four on each side. You can see it has four here. And um, if you have a 70 or 90cc, you have seven on each. Um, if you have some modified packs of eight or even 10, so that is 32 or 40 of these weights. And I will explain what these are. Now, um, if you, in the earlier days of these clutch packs, what you did is you had um, weights closer to the variator style weights, um, where they were these rollers. They had these ramps, and what it did was, is the faster the clutch spun, um, they would roll up the ramp, and then they would push against the plates. Um, the problem is, is that um, when these start to wear, what happens is that they get little flat spots on them. And when you get flat spots, um, you get uneven acceleration and you get uneven engagement. And um, that's why when you see you have a variator um, on your, if, if you have automatic scooters, you'll find you have to replace the roller weights uh, maybe every 10,000 miles or so, so that it has um, constant smooth engagement because there's always these flat spots that get worn in. Um, so a better way when Honda revised this is they went to the bob weight system. Now you can see here, that what these do is the way that they are, they these are disengaged, they do not touch the clutch, the back clutch plate at all. So they do not reach when the engine is at spinning at low speed, or if they do, they're not putting that much pressure. But when you get to a higher RPM, what you're going to do is that these things, these weights will want to fling outward harder. And you can see this action it's actually pushing, you see how I'm pushing now against the clutch and pushing against the pack. What it is doing, it is actually closing that gap. You see there's that millimeter or so gap. And then the weights are flinging outward and pushing against the gap now. And so what they are doing, uh, so what this is, is this effectively is engaging the clutch. But when you spin down, the weights don't push as, they don't put as much pressure on the plate. So you see how that works. So low RPM, they disengage, and that gap still allows for the clutch to freewheel. But as soon as you spin up, engagement, see? And then these start to push against the clutch plates like this. And the way that these are held together, keep in mind, remember, is that you see that bell is, um, the, the bell is actually pulling outwards, is pulling outwards like this because of these springs that are here and the springs are pushing outward and so the bell is preventing the plates from going out the back because that is what is holding the plates together so that is how the centrifugal part of this clutch works but what happens when you want to change gears you change gears at any rpm basically that's what gears are for so you can't rely on these centrifugal weights to do the job you need to be able to have a mechanism that disconnects all of this regardless of how far these weights are going out and you want to be able to disengage these plates completely when you want to change your gears so you don't smash the cogs of your gearbox together. You see, you don't want to have these little tiny cogs bearing the weight of all of this spinning rotational mass of the magneto and the crankshaft and the clutch pack. And um, as small as these engines are, these are quite hefty, I've got to say. I mean, some, these, these are several kilos. There's several kilos of rotating mass. And if you don't think that can do a lot of damage, just take a three kilogram rock or something and throw it at your face and you get the idea of what I'm saying. So how do we disengage the pack from these weights? Well, the clue lies in the back of this spindle right here, and you can see it has several notches. And in fact, if, if I am to take this whole assembly, you can see that it slides back and forth along these notches, along these guides, right? So, you see that? It's sliding along the guides. So if we can move the pack as far if we can move the pack away from the weights, you can see there is a limit because of this ring that limits them to how far they can go. So if we move the pack far enough away, 
doesn't matter how fast the engine is spinning, these weights will not go any further. They can't because they are held back by this retaining ring. So what we need to do is we need to have a type of mechanism that will slide this entire clutch pack away from the weights. See? But what we also need, you've got to remember, is this is held together by a bunch of springs too. And there are springs in this um, assembly which is holding the sandwich together as well. So what we need to do is we also need to have a way to push down on the springs. We have to disengage the springs and push the clutch pack away from the weights. And so how do we disengage both the springs and remove the pack from the weights? And the answer lies in the bell itself. So if you remember, there are springs that are inside of here, and that is what these screws are holding, um, that, that is what they are pushing against if there were springs. I took out the springs because I can't physically actuate this um, because it's, they're too heavy. Um, but um, these screws are holding these springs in here, and these springs are pushing against the pack like this. But you can see, if we were to actually push against the face of the bell itself, okay, so let's say we're pushing against the pace of the bell. You see that? Now the bell is actually, it's moved up three, two, three millimeters away from the, um, the, the post, uh, from the, the washers. And these, and now what has happened is that because in here, the back plate of the clutch pack is against this tab right here, so that back plate, which is right here, you see the one with the post, is actually now, because it is co um, connected to the clutch bell, it is being pushed out by the clutch bell um, because you pushed against the face of the clutch bell and that is pushing the whole pack away. And that is what pushes, that is, that is how you push against the pack of the clutch bell. And that provides the distance that you need to clear the weights. You see? So now the weights are disengaged. So when you release the clutch bell, these go back down and now the weights... It, it, it goes back down and now the weights can push against the assembly. But when we push the bell in, it pushes against the back plate and now it disengages from the weights altogether. When we let it go, it falls back against the weights. See how that works? And just from the front angle, you can see how um, the bell goes, how the bell slides back and forth. Okay, so we get the idea, right? So as a quick review, you can see that um, this, this spindle free wheels and um, the spindle on the outside is connected to the crankshaft. Um, but if we were to, and, and this pack does not touch the spindle itself. It is held at just the right distance to where there is a small gap of about a millimeter or so. But that is where these weights come into play, is when the engine spins faster, these weights fling out, and then they, they push against the plate, and which is being held in by the tension of these springs, which are right here, and there's four of these. And so that is where you get your gripping force, is these weights fling outward, they push against the pack, which then in turn pushes against the bell, which pushes against the springs. It's kind of a complicated um, system, but that is how that works. And that is how the centrifugal action of the clutch works. So that's why you get um, disengagement at idle, but once you spin up faster, these weights fling outward and engage the clutch, and then you get locking, um, then it locks and it's engaged. But to change gear at any RPM, what you need to do is separate the pack altogether from the, um, to, to push it far enough away from the weights so that the weights can't reach. See the weights as far as out as they go, they can't reach. And what that, and that is done by this tab right here, which is connected to the back end of the, which is pushed against by the tab in here. You can see where the tab will go in. And when you push down the bell, see in the back right here. So when you when you push down the bell, and then it pushes against this tab right here. 
like so. So you see it's not pushing against the spindle but it's pushing against the tab and it's releasing it pushes the pack far enough away so that the centrifugal weights can no longer um, push against the pack and therefore it disengages the clutch at any RPM and so whenever you want to change gear that is when you push um, down on the clutch it pushes the tab pushes the plates away and then when you release it goes back down and now the weights can grab and do their job. Now that would be enough um, to to get the job done if you think about it because um, you can see all right we stop and um, it's not engaged you want to set off okay now it's engaged um, I want to change gear moves the pack away and then uh, changes gears because because the the crankshaft is now disengaged from the transmission and then we re-engage it when um, we we release the lever so all fine and good right that's that's all you need right but as I've said, there's four purposes to this clutch, and there's three more, uh, two more things that it does, and so I'm going to explain that. And what we're going to explain next, number three, is the slipper clutch. Now you might have heard of slipper clutches before if you're a motorcycle enthusiast, um, or if you've just worked around motorcycles, you might have heard of a slipper clutch. The job of this slipper clutch is to prevent the rear wheel from locking up and skipping when you downshift. Now think of it, when you are slowing down at high RPMs, you can feel the engine drag. That's what engine braking is. And so you can feel the engine dragging. But imagine now if you were at a lower RPM, say around four or 5,000, and you were to change from third to second gear. Well, now you have to be spinning at, we'll say 8,000 RPMs. Well, to, to get your engine to spin from five to 8,000 RPMs takes quite a considerable amount of force. And if you change suddenly, what can happen is that your rear wheel can completely lock up or it can chatter because the rear wheel is trying to literally push the engine to a higher RPM, but it can't do it as quickly. So it's losing traction. That's why it's chattering. Or you can lock up the rear wheel altogether and lose traction for a moment. And that is a very bad thing. Now, this is often why uh, race bikes have this sort of thing, because, you know, they have uh, they run at very very high engine speeds and the last thing you want to do is lose traction when you're going 200 miles per hour now just imagine i'm going to just not include many much physics at all here i'm just going to try and do a very simple explanation so you can see that um of course as i was mentioning that this spindle um this inside part rotates independently right but um, what I haven't, um, but um, and it only rotates one way. Now, of course, engines only rotate one way. And in, in this case, if you were to look at the clutch side of the engine, like this, uh, the engine was to, um, the engine rotates clockwise. So, um, but what happens if you think about it when your rear wheel locks up? So let's say you do that change from third to second, and your rear wheel has to compensate by spinning the engine up that quickly. Um, what happens is you actually get force going the other way. So in this case, anti-clockwise. So the opposite, normally the engine is what is providing the propelling force, right? And so you're only going to have that force going one way. But when the wheel goes the opposite way, now, now it goes the opposite way because it's, it's, it's fighting the engine, you get torque going the other way. Now when you get torque going the other way, um, as I've said, now you have the wheel pushing the engine, not the engine pushing the wheel. But what happens is now you have force going the other way as well. So this is the only time that force will go the other way, if you think about it. The wheel pushing the engine, because wheels don't run on petrol, the engine runs on petrol, you know, and petrol's your energy source. So the only condition that you are going to have the engine going the opposite way um, the engine the torque being applied in the opposite way to the engine is when you have this condition. So what you can do, and what um, the slipper clutch does, is when torque gets applied the opposite way, you can see that action right here. So when I apply torque going the way the engine rotates, nothing happens. But you see, now that I apply torque the opposite way, you can see that the clutch is actually being disengaged. You see that? Now, why is this? Why does that help? Well, think about it. If you have the rear wheel applying torque in the opposite way, trying to push the engine to go faster, and there's no mechanism to release that torque, then the only way, the only, the chain is as weak as its weakest link. And the weakest link in this case is going to be your tire. 
and your tire is going to lose traction and that's the thing you don't want to happen. So what this does is it causes something else to lose traction so to speak and what loses traction in this case is actually the clutch you see. So when you apply torque the opposite way instead of your your tire breaking traction it pushes the opposite way and causes your clutch to break traction see. So now it's going the opposite way and it's disconnected from the bob weights well mostly and so you, when you lose when it pulls the clutch this way then you have less force being applied to the clutch and with less force being applied to the clutch then the clutch gets a chance to slip rather than the wheel slipping. So the way that this works is that um, and it has to do with this right here. Now you can see right here there's these, there's a ramp right and you can see there's a corresponding place for the ramp to go in on this um, the collar that holds the clutch plates. So but it only slopes one way so because it slopes one way that means that it will only the ramp will only be actuated in one direction. So when I apply torque in one direction it does not move. You see I apply torque going backwards it pushes the clutch plates outward like this. That is how this ramp works so one direction goes smoothly. The other direction it disengages and pushes against the clutch and that's how it works and that's basically how all slipper clutches work. The last thing we're going to talk about here is the fourth thing and that is the oil filter. Now when I say oil filter I'm not talking about the strainer screen like this I mean an actual and, and this is no good. I mean think about it you can pass giant relatively giant particles through this thing and when this gets clogged well then you have no oil flow so that's a really stupid thing that's just a strainer. The oil filter is actually this piece right here believe it or not. How is that possible you might ask? I'm going to show you how it is possible. Okay so just um, bear with me here. See this? These recesses are where you trap particles of whatever you don't want circulating in your oil. So you, you, you trap them in here. And if you don't believe me, here is a picture. You can see the accumulation of particles in there and that is the whole point to having um, to cleaning this strainer area out every once in a while. Maybe, I don't know, I clean mine all the time but um, you know it's, it does have a capacity and it can fill up. So, um, but you understand the point. And the way that this seals and this bit which is also the clutch pressure plate remember as we were talking about how the clutch gets pushed in and out like this well this plate is actually the part that it pushes against you see here is your bell um, here, um, here is your clutch actuator which goes on top I'm not going to explain how it works in, in this video but it pushes down against here in the bearing is where it pushes against. This is a thrust bearing by the way just like the ones that you will see in a car. Now if this was not an oil filter all you would need is a way for the lid so to speak the pressure plate to be bolted here. But the reason you have a gasket on here is because it has to create an oil tight seal and because what you're doing is you're actually pumping oil through here and remember this this assembly is rotating at you know, many thousands of rpms and so that because it's spinning at many thousands of rpms it's actually slinging bits of oil to the edges right and because it's slinging bits of oil to the edges it, the particles are going to be attracted to the edges too so as it spins and spins it's going to be filtering out your oil that way. This is a centrifuge and if you think centrifuges are not very effective um, you can see that you have very very effective centrifuge um, filtering systems that can filter waste oil um, that are so fine they can be fed through diesel fuel injectors. That's how waste vegetable oil um, is filtered is through centrifuges oftentimes because it's a lot more cost effective to have an assembly filter something out by spinning and then you just wipe up the particles rather than pushing it through a filter like a paper medium or something. So that is the same principle that this oil filter works in. Lots of spinning and then the particles fling out to the edges and then when you take off the clutch the particles will be stuck in here. That's why these recesses are cut out in the first place and then you can scrape them off and clean them out. And then one, and then once all said and done you just put a new gasket or the old one if it if it's still in good shape put it back on and then you have your oil filter completely reusable and very very effective so it's actually a pretty ingenious little 
assembly this, it also works as your oil filter, and a very good one at that too. I mean, you get very tiny particles out with this thing. Just remember to clean it so that it is always, um, so that it does not overflow, and then, you know, it doesn't work anymore. In my opinion, this is an ingenious little piece of kit, because you see, there's only one thing, there's only one clutch assembly that does so many jobs, acts as a centrifugal clutch, acts, you know, to disengage at any RPMs, it also acts as a slipper clutch, and it's also an oil filter, all in one. Um, personally, I think that besides the engineers and maybe a few people close to Honda, I think that you know, most people had no idea how this worked. And um, I know I was that way. When I used to be a, a, a pizza delivery boy, a little Japanese pizza delivery boy, all I know is that you put fuel in your vehicle and then it worked and sometimes it got dirty and you had to clean it out. That's all I knew. But as I began to take things apart and study them, um, I realized just how ingenious this little piece of kit is. And I wanted to share that with you to, to show you how it worked and how, well, how cool I think that is. And so hopefully this video was interesting and enlightening to you. I um, hope you learned something. Until next time, I'm Mini Motorman. Goodbye.